How do you define a war? What really adds up to a war or a conflict? Is the way how we conventionally define war homogenizing and thus an injustice to the lived experiences of its victims? Or is it only a tussle between two or more nation states? Because if it really is, then what about its people? Well, a war is never a mere conflict or struggle between two or more people or communities. It is larger than that. It starts way before it has actually begun and ends way after its designated termination. The war between Palestine and Israel is one such example of how we wouldn't conventionally define this war. The Israeli-Palestine conflict is one of the world's most enduring conflicts with the Israeli occupation of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip reaching 54 years of conflict. While a lot of scholars also deem that the conflict has a history of more than 100 years. However, in this conflict, Palestinians were never really given the space of peace. And whenever it was, it was either on the lines of Israel or United States of America, or more so on the lines of political elites. Welcome to Unslant, a podcast where we unravel the diversity of Asian politics. In this episode, we have with us Dr. Rashid Khalidi to discuss further on the different aspects of year-long war in Palestine and what future does this conflict hold. Welcome to Unsland, Dr. Khadiri. We are absolutely glad to have you on board. Um, with respect to your book, The Hundred Years is of uh, War on Palestine, A History of Settler Colonialism and Resistance. I believe this interview is going to be an eye-opening interview for me and most students alike who are interested into such studies and realizing and looking at the different aspects of how conflicts work or what are the different multi-sectoral aspects um, before we move ahead, for the sake of our, our, of our audience, uh, why don't you start with telling us a little bit about yourself, your intellectual journey, and how did you came to do about this project, or your journey of your book? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, well, um, the topic of Palestine is something I've done a great deal of work on. Um, I've written several books on aspects of Palestinian history. Um, this book is very different in a couple of respects. Um, it draws on my own personal experiences. Uh, it draws on family archives and it draws on family stories and family memoirs and both published and unpublished materials to personalize um, this story of what I call a hundred years war on Palestine. Um, I'm a Palestinian from a family uh, that originates in Jerusalem. Um, members of my family have played different roles in Palestinian politics and in Palestinian intellectual life and cultural life and legal life. I had ancestors who were judges and so forth. Um, and I draw on all of those personal and family uh, uh, aspects uh, to illustrate this story. There are photographs, there's, there, are, there are things my parents and my aunts and uncles told me, there are things from the memoirs written by members of the family. And so in that respect, it's completely different uh, from other books I've written, which are historical monographs where I don't use the first person. Um, here I draw on my own experiences. These include uh, the fact that my father worked for the United Nations in what was then called the Political and Security Council Affairs Division of the Secretariat of the UN. So he was in the Security Council for all meetings relating to the Middle East for the better part of two decades. And so I, I heard these stories for, as, a, as an adolescent and, uh, and I, I, I uh, followed closely uh, what was going on at the UN, what was going on in terms of Palestine uh, in my youth as a college student and as a graduate student. And I later on became involved in Palestinian politics myself. I later on became and I'm obviously an academic. I've been teaching for more than 40 years um, at different universities in the Middle East and in the United States. I'm, I'm currently at Columbia University. Um, and uh, I also have served as an advisor 
to the Palestinian delegation that was negotiating with the Israelis in from 1991 to 1993. So I have some personal and family experience of what has happened in Palestine. Um, and I have, I've written several books on the topic, a historical monograph. So this book sums those things up. And I hope in a way that's relatable and accessible to an audience that is not made up of specialists, of people who don't know that much about the topic, they're just interested. So that's a quick summary of you know, my background and how it connects to the book. Right, right. Um, that sounds like a great start to this entire journey that we're going to have through, uh, through this interview. So because you mentioned uh, that this book is specifically different as compared to different um, uh, other books that you've written, because this is something, if I were to term it, a personal account of one sort, because it is written in first person. Um, also, again, for the sake of our audiences and for a broader picture before we move into chapter-wise questions, would you um, give us a brief view as to uh, what were the approaches and the methodology that you used to build the narrative of your book along with the core theme that it presents? Well, I'll try and summarize it quickly. Um, I, I mean, ha having written a great deal about Palestine, I, I thought that what I would try and do is to summarize for a general reader, um, the basic thrust of what I think is happening. There are many false views of what happens in Palestine. One of them, for example, is that this is a conflict that has been going on since time immemorial. Completely false. It's a modern conflict created in the modern era as a result of colonialism and nationalism. There was no nationalism 200 years ago. So not only 2000 years ago, 200 years ago, there was nothing approximating this conflict. It has no ancient roots. Now, it's true. You have people who have a religious background or a nationalist background who will claim ancient history to this or that element of the conflict. This is essentially false. This is myth-making. This is 20th century and 21st century myth-making uh, by nationalists or by advocates of this or that religious view. In fact, there was no conflict 150 years ago or 200 years ago. Jews were not fighting Arabs. There were no Zionists. There were no Arab nationalists or Palestinian nationalists. So the conflict in whatever, in whatever uh, 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 format you see it in today did not exist a long time ago. So that's the first point to make. It's a result of modern phenomena, nationalism, colonialism. The second point I try and make in the book and the second framing uh, device is that this has never been a simple conflict between two national groups. There's a national element to it, of course. I've already said that nationalism is part of it. But this is not Germany versus France. You know, this is not something which is a matter of these ones are here and those ones are there. This is a conflict that is rooted, as I've said, in both nationalism but also in colonialism. Were it not for the British, you would not have had the partition of India. Were it not for the British, you would not have had the partition of Palestine and the, and the conflict that ensued. You would not have had the implantation of the Zionist project in Palestine in the way in which it was implanted. So a great deal of what we see is a result not mainly or only or largely a result of the conflict between what have become two national groups, Palestinians and Israelis, but rather of the intervention of external powers, most notably Great Britain in the first instance, and then later on a variety of others, from other European countries, and especially more recently, the United States, obviously, but also various Arab countries. Without this, in other words, you cannot understand various phases of this without seeing the British did this in the 30s, uh, or the United Nations did this in the 40s, imposed things, created conditions, uh, dictated outcomes. This was not just Jews and Arabs, or Israelis and Palestinians, or Israelis and the Arab states. There, were, there was a global set of circumstances. And this is why, finally, I describe this in two terms. First of all, I describe it as a war on Palestine. It's not just a war between Israelis and Palestinians. This has been a war to create a specific outcome in Palestine at the expense of the Palestinian people. The British didn't come to adjudicate between two groups. The British came to give one group a privileged status at the expense of another group. That's the Balfour Declaration. That's the mandate for Palestine. The mandate for Palestine is not an even-handed document. The Balfour Declaration is not an even-handed document. There's one national group in the Balfour Declaration. There's one national group in 
the mandate for Palestine, under which Britain ruled the country from 1922 until 1948. So what I'm arguing is that under the screen of international neutrality and international legality, what was going on was an attempt to impose something on the indigenous native Arab population of Palestine. And that, that has continued to the present day. Different backers, different external actors, different outcomes, but that is consistent. And the last part of my framing is to argue that this is a national conflict, of course. And it's an, that's a very important, in some ways, a central aspect of it. But it's also a colonial settler project. It's also a conflict between a group which has the national ambitions and national, national dimensions. The Israelis are a people, and they've created a powerful modern nation state. But they came as part of a colonial project to settle Europeans in a non-European land and to displace the native population. That happened in Ireland over 750 years. That happened in North America, starting in the 16th and 17th centuries. That happened in Australia, that happened in Canada. In all of these cases, to a very large extent, successfully. It also happened in South Africa, Algeria, Kenya, Rhodesia, less successfully. These were European settler colonial projects. They were different from Palestine because Zionism is a national project at the same time. But uh, this, this, this appellation of it as a settler colonial project is not some kind of smear or slur or anti-Semitic innuendo. It's what the Zionist project willingly accepted as a description of itself for its first five or six decades. Until really World War II, there was no inhibition among Zionists in saying, yes, we have rights here. Yes, we are a national group. But yes, we are European settlers. Herzl says it. Jabotinsky says it. Ben Gurion, all the early leaders of the Zionist project and the early leaders of Israel are very un, un, uninhibited, unabashed, privately and in some cases publicly, in talking about the colonial nature of what they're doing. One of the major funding uh, institutions, the Jewish Colonization Agency, had in its title the term colonization. So to say this is a settler colonial project is not kind of some kind of slur. It's what they accepted themselves as being. Obviously, the world changed after World War II. You had decolonization. Settler colonialism was in bad odor. Zionism transformed itself. It became an anti-colonial movement. It sold itself as such. But I, I try and argue that what you see in the West Bank today is a continuation of a practice that goes back to the very origins of the Zionist project. So those are the main framing devices I use. This is a personal, I mean, I use I, 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 I write in the first person in the book, I draw on, on family material, material from other families and personal material, but at the same time, it's, I try to, to rigorously document. It. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of pages of footnotes, and there's a great deal of original research there as well to try and show some of these more controversial aspects uh, of my analysis. Right. Um... There is this very interesting point that you also made here, and I also realized it while I was reading the book. Um, at the very, uh, you mentioned about how, in also in the six different chapters of your book, you mentioned as to how this was a waged war, right? Right. Uh, right, and and that is what you mentioned here and elaborated upon. And also at the very core, you also go on to argue in your book that as to how this wasn't just a struggle between two simple communities, but it was larger than that. It was and is, of course, very multi-sectoral in its very nature, the entire conflict. Now in exactly. this process, now in this process, what as as per my opinion, as a reader, what I have realized is that you have given a very unconventional narrative to the definition of war which is not very much talked mm. about in the mainstream dialogues of war and conflict as such. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, and you can answer this, of course, with regards to the Palestinian conflict, but for a larger perspective, what are those aspects that add up to a war? Because, of course, it's a process, and that is what you've also sort of elaborated in your book as well. And if you were to define it in an answer, what would you say? Well, I would, I would point you to the... Um, to the set of events that actually drew me to my title, which is the Hundred Years' War between a dynasty in England and a dynasty in France. It was actually not a war between English and French. The, 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 the entire English aristocracy spoke French. They were Anglo-Normans. So it was not an Anglo-French war. That's how it's been coded. 
So if you read Shakespeare, Henry V, you know, Henry V doesn't speak French. Of course he spoke French. Yeah, yeah. The, the chancery records were in, in French and Latin until the 16th century, 15th century. In, in, right. In any case, right. Uh, if you look at the Hundred Years' War or the Thirty Years' War, um, what you will see is that there are long periods of conflict followed by periods of less conflict. And that's how I would describe our Hundred Years' War. There was a, it was part of an attempt to do things that could only be done by force. And so there were outbreaks of enormous violence in 1920, in 1921, in 1929, especially in Palestine during the mandate, 36 to 39, a great Arab revolt. Then again, 47, 48, and then at different times, obviously, in the decades since 1948. Um, and so between the periods of extreme conflict, there were periods of much less intense conflict. But the struggle was still going on. Um, I, I lived in Lebanon for most of what is now called the Lebanese Civil War, which extended from sometime in the mid 1970s until about 1990 uh, uh, or 91. Uh, there were periods when there was no fighting, but we call it the Lebanese Civil War, a 15, 16 year period during which uh, conflict erupted and became extremely violent, and then periods when it was less so. So it's in that sense that I think one can talk about a hundred years of war on Palestine. Um, it's true. Uh, there are periods in which there's much less violence. Um, I, I, in fact, there's always some. Uh, when you have occupation, when you have settler colonialism, there are always people being pushed off the land. There are always people who resist. Uh, and there are sometimes people shot one a day or two a day. There are Palestinians being killed every single day in the occupied territories. Uh, in the last week, there have been four Palestinians. Now, that's not that doesn't rise to the level of the bombardment of Gaza in May of 2021 uh, or, or the level of uh, the fighting in Lebanon between the PLO and Israel during 1982. Certainly, those are you know, major conflicts by comparison with the daily murder of Palestinian demonstrators or Palestinian kids. Uh, nevertheless, I think they have to be seen as part of a conflict which can be described as a hundred years war. And like the hundred years war between the Plantagenets and the Valois uh, kings of France, uh, it, this has stretched over more than a hundred years. A hundred years war uh, uh, went oh, about 116 or 117 years between Eng English and French crowns. Um, this one has gone obviously more than 100 years, even by my counting. Right, um, which sounds like a pretty um, interesting answer because this has led me at this. Probably this is something that I might just take back and think about, of course, because there are certain perspectives that just popped up inside my head. But yes, continuing with uh, another question, um, and consider this a follow up of the first question, of course. Um, the six chapters that you've divided in your book. All of them sort of talk about how most of the wars or most of the conflicts that happened were a sort of they happened as a result of set of declarations of the accords that were signed, right? And mm -hmm. all the declarations and accords that were signed haven't till date, as per I would want to see it, even if it is um, within my limited perspective at this point in time they haven't in any sort added to peace to the region and to the affected population. They haven't, uh, say again, I'm sorry, they haven't? They haven't added to peace to the region ah, yes. and to the affected right. population. They still did, they haven't. And that is majorly, which your book also mentions, is because of all these, most of these accords and declarations were signed at the height of uprisings between the, let's say, quote-unquote, elite powers without cons considering the core stakeholders, that is the affected population, the vulnerable population as such. So what, according to you, does this say about the idea of quote-unquote peace that Western nations talk so highly of? And moreover, do you right. think that does the you know will to peace really exist in the political sphere as we see it mm -hmm. in the contemporary senses as well? That's a good question. Um, I mean, I think you're right in pointing out that each of the so-called declarations of war, I, I frame the chapter, I sorry, I frame the book, as you said, in terms of six chapters, uh, each of which is described as the first declaration of war, the second declaration of war, and so forth. And I have six of them. Um, and so each of them is framed, as, as, you, as you point out, um, not so much by anything that Arabs or Israelis do, or Arabs or Jews do, as by international sanction, international approval, 
international, uh, uh, in some cases, uh, initiatives by the British or by the Americans or by the UN uh, or by the League of Nations, uh, which lead to war and which, and which uh, sanction and approve of war. Um, and so what I'm doing here is trying to point to the fact that for all that this is a national conflict between Israelis and Palestinians, so an international conflict. It is one that is fueled by and driven by, and in many cases, uh, the result of the actions of the great powers. Um, so you're correct in your, in, in, in your reading of that. And as to why that doesn't lead to peace, and here again, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, it is because the great powers have generally speaking been favorable to this process, process of usurpation of Palestine uh, by, uh, in, in, the, in, in the words of Zeb Jabotinsky, who is one of the most influential thinkers and leaders of the Zionist movement, yeah. the transformation of Palestine, he puts Palestine in quotes, into the land of Israel. That is what is going on now. That is what has always been the objective. To, this is seen from a Zionist perspective as a country which only legitimately belongs to one people, the Jewish people. And until the full transformation of that country has taken place, the struggle has to continue. This is why you have what happens in Sheikh Jarrah. This is why you have settlement expansion. This is why you have conflict between settlers uh, and, and uh, Palestinian villagers trying to cultivate their land all over the West Bank every day. It's part of a process of usurpation and dispossession. Um, and as long as that is sanctioned and supported and armed and financed from the outside, the outside is responsible, whether it's the United States or whether it's the United States and the Soviet Union back in 1947 when both approved the partition resolution or whether it's Great Britain. Uh, it, 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 I'm not saying it's down to them. I'm not saying it's caused by them. But I'm saying you can't see it in a fashion which excludes them. They are part of the problem. Part of the reason there isn't peace is because they are furthering this process of dispossession, uh, this process of usurpation. Um, they're accepting it. And they're not just accepting, they're not just sitting back. They're passing resolutions that allow it to happen. They're giving Israel the weapons with which it does these things. And they're financing this. You know, the United States gives, gives Israel money for weapons. But there's this huge pipeline of money, tax deductible donations, going for settlements in the West Bank, going to support of these processes, without which Israel couldn't do what it does. So the United States or European countries or other countries, India, China, Russia, are all in different ways in the 21st century involved in this, sanctioning, approving, condoning, allowing, at the very least, what happens. Um, it's true, sometimes you've had efforts by some of these countries to limit this or even to stop this or reverse this, but those have never, ever stopped the process. And they've never been, and they've never been pursued. So you had Secretary Kerry tried to do something at the very end of the Obama administration. Uh, Secretary of State Baker and President George H.W. Bush, back at the time of the Madrid Peace Conference, tried to do something. Yeah. President. Clinton, President Carter, you can, you can describe various initiatives, international initiatives, UN initiatives. Basically, the bulldozer never stopped. The exactly. usurpation never stopped. The building of settlements never stopped. The expulsion of Palestinians never stopped. Over a hundred year period, not just the last few decades. So uh, I think that is why we don't have peace. It's not just that you have these two irre irreconcilable nationalisms. Maybe they would be reconcilable, maybe not. But you'd have to have some will on the part of the international community, not just to talk vaporous words about peace, but to understand this underlying dynamic. If you don't understand the underlying dynamic, you can't deal with it. And they haven't. They won't. They refuse to. Uh, you don't accept uh, the Amnesty International uh, analysis that this is an apartheid system. Then you can't dismantle it. You can't say, well, we have to have equality. Uh, we, ha we have to have a settlement on the basis of equality. If you don't accept a certain understanding of the situation, you won't change the situation. And that has unfortunately been the, the, the way it's been uh, for most of these hundred years. Right, right, exactly. And because we are um, talking about the different aspects of this entire conflict, um, this also leads me to another uh, character or let's say the stakeholder in this entire picture which is the PLO the Palestinian Liberation Organization 
um they of course had a huge role to play especially when it comes to let's say they had a what they had what sorry they of course had a huge role to play in the entire picture of this entire conflict if you were to look at it they are of course a major character or the major stakeholder of this entire picture right comes to you know, winning the UNGA podium in 1974 if i'm correct with the dates and let's say success right. yeah and successes it gathered in terms of the recognition but if we were to not view plo in isolation but in the larger context of the entire conflict do you think that the plo leadership was just another pawn in the chess play when it comes to really understanding the conflict and the affected people of palestine mhm well that's a that's a good question um in the book I, and in other things i've i've written um i i've leveled a very harsh critique at the plo uh, leaderships uh, over time especially more recently um in the last couple of decades uh i think that at a certain moment in time the plo the plo played an important historical role in reviving palestinian nationalism in bringing the palestine cause to the world stage in giving the palestinians an international voice that they had never had before palestinians were not invited to talk to anybody up through the 1960s True. they were completely excluded from the deliberations about partition in 1947 their country was being partitioned they exactly. weren't consulted the zionists were the zionist movement was uh they weren't consulted by the mandate they weren't consulted at the time of the balfour declaration they weren't consulted in 1967 when un security council resolution 242 was passed in november after the june 1967 war they never were allowed to speak they didn't have what edward said called permission to narrate they were not invited to the table the plo achieved that they, precisely with the resolution you mentioned of 1974 of the plo being mentioned being named by the un general assembly as the sole legitimate representative of the palestinian people being invited uh, to have observer status at the united nations and so forth um so i think that up until certainly that point and through the 70s and into the 80s uh, i don't think it would be fair to call them a pawn or to say that they were playing uh, or 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 to, or to or to deny the fact that they played a positive role in reestablishing a Palestinian voice internationally um they succeeded in in achieving recognition from over 100 countries i mean this was a major achievement for the palestinians they never they something that they had never been able to do previously on the other hand i would say that from sometime in the late 80s and into the 90s onwards um they faltered and whether uh they became a pawn of other actors or whether they fell into traps that had been set for them or whether they made terribly uh, uh misjudged decisions one can be much much more critical of them from the 90s onwards certainly uh into the present and i would argue that the plo itself has really been diminished the development of the so-called palestinian authority in the west bank and in gaza um which to some extent has become uh, a tool of external actors whether it's the 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 the, the palestinian authority in ramallah or whether it's the hamas led government whatever you want to call it in 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 gaza i don't think either of them have effectively advocated for the palestinians i don't think any of the either of them uh, is immune to external influence to a debilitating degree i i could be even harsher about that um to some extent they've served the occupier uh to to so to such a great degree that it's really questionable whether they're playing a, a national role or a liber, liberation role a role in terms of liberating the palestinians from the conditions that they're in so i would be very harshly critical of palestinian leadership uh over the last certainly couple of decades and, and more uh i think that the decisions that they made in accepting the oslo accord uh were a catastrophe for the palestinians going back to the the early 1990s when we were negotiating in Madrid and Washington with an Israeli delegation we were presented with essentially the same terms that they ended up accepting the PLO ended up accepting in, in the Oslo accords we we that is to say the delegation chosen by the PLO by the way which was negotiating at Madrid and Washington refused those conditions because they were they, they excluded self-determination statehood sovereignty control over borders and end to settlement 
Palestinian control over the Arab parts of Jerusalem, control over water, control over land. In other words, everything important was excluded from the terms that Israel uh, 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 that, that Israel put forward, and that unfortunately uh, the PLO accepted. So I think you can certainly go back to sometime in the '90s and in the last two decades and say that they have played, in my view, a largely negative role in terms of Palestinian interests. Right. Um, this also um, gets me to my another question, which probably could be a follow-up follow up of this, because, for example, when I, as a reader, not only of the book, but also of the entire, let's say, researches, etc., that come out about the entire Palestine and Israel conflict, and also, for example, if you look at the media reports that come out, let's say, in with regards to the 20, uh, May of 2021, the entire conflict that happened again, this is one thing that I've realized that Palestine, it could probably again be my limited perspective at this point in time because I've just started, in, like I've just initiated researching about different things and different aspects of a conflict whatsoever. Um, this is one thing that I realized that Palestine has never been talked of in isolation. It is always in relation to Israel, even in academia right. for the mo most part, or let's say whatsoever I have read so far. So how do you think that this entire image was in part shaped by the media and their representation of the conflict? Also, if we look at it from the contemporary perspective as well. Mm. You know, another good, good question, actually. Um, you know, I've, 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 I've thought a great deal about this, actually, having dealt a, a little bit with the media myself and, and being an avid consumer of the media. And as a historian who pays attention to these things. And so it's a very, it's a very good question. Um, one of the amazing things about the Zionist movement, the Zionist project, the Zionist movement, and later the state of Israel, is that at the same time that it was obviously a national movement, and at the same time as it was a settler, settler colonial, colonial settler project. And at the same time that it developed structures of governance, and at the same time as it developed a very uh, uh, powerful military capability, um, even before there was a state, but certainly since there's been a state of Israel, it was always understood and active and successful as a public relations project, as in terms of proselytizing, not just people who would settle in Palestine, arguing that anti-Semitism in Europe was such that there was no safe haven for Jews except in a national homeland, but also proselytizing potential supporters in European countries, in the West, and in the rest of the world. Um, it's called in Hebrew Hasbara. Uh, it means propaganda or, or, or information, or, and it is a central component of everything that the Zionists have done ever since the very beginning. Um, in so doing, they had a, an advantage in that the early Zionist leaders, the early Zionist, uh, the pioneers, the people who were the spokespersons for this project and later for the state came from the countries they were proselytizing. They were themselves English, American, British, German, French, Russian. They spoke those languages. They came from those cultures. They understood the people they were talking to intimately. They were not Indians or Arabs for whom speaking to a British audience during the period of the mandate or speaking to an American audience required an acclimatization and a learning process that in many cases was very steep. It took a long time for colonized peoples to learn to speak the language of world politics. It, it, it was not a problem for people who came from all over the world. They were themselves. I mean, Herzl was an Austrian. Now, he's, he, he suffered from anti-Semitism. He understood the problem uh, the Jews faced in Europe. But he was an Austrian. He was a journalist in Austria. Uh, 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 Golda Meir grew up in Milwaukee. Uh, uh, I could go down the list. Uh, it's less true in the 21st century because you have many, many Israelis. Um, who were born in Israel and who are, who are native Hebrew speakers before anything else. But most of the spokespersons, the ambassadors and so on and so forth, and many of the ministers to this day are themselves natives of other countries. I mean, uh, Michael Oran, the minister, he's been a minister. He's, he's an American. 
uh, many of the ministers have been Russians. That is to say, they come from Russia. They're Israelis. They're, they, 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 but they, they know the cultures and speak the languages of the countries that they're trying to, to deal with. Uh, and this has been, a, this is one of many aspects uh, that has given uh, Israel and, and, and before that the Zionist movement an enormous advantage uh, in public relations and in dealing with the media. Um, they had other advantages, of course. You know, if you can tack a modern national movement onto a universally revered uh, text like the Bible, you have an advantage. I mean, how many people know that a large percentage of Palestinians are Christians? None. I mean, they have a biblical. How many people know that as far as the Muslims are concerned, the, the prophets of the Hebrew Bible are prophets of Islam? Nobody knows that. Yeah. Exactly. There's, a, there's a biblical connection, not just for Jews, but for Christians, and that there's a sacred connection to this land for Muslims as well. Nobody knows that. Everybody knows about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and so on and so forth. Everybody knows it. Christian, Jew, non-Jew, non-Christian. Why? Because the world has been colonized by European Christian powers. Yeah. The Bible is part of our DNA. If we're Indonesians or Indians or Arabs or whatever we may be, whether we're Christian or Hindu, Muslim, Jain, it doesn't matter. Um, that's another advantage. And, and, and I mean, there's a legitimate connection, obviously, between Judaism and the land of Israel. That's a historical connection. But the way in which the Bible has been attached to a modern national project is a remarkably advantage uh, for uh, 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 advocates of the state of Israel. You know, God gave this land to us. Uh, there's a famous movie, which perhaps if you're fortunate, you haven't seen called Exodus. This land is my land. God gave this land to me. That's the song. Well, you know, that's a really familiar, not just tune, but idea. How do you compete with that in public relations? How do you compete with that in terms of the media? I mean, you start with a bias if, if you're a so-called objective journalist. Um, that has changed over time, I have to say. I think the media has changed, uh, certainly since the 80s or 90s. It changed first, I think, with the invasion of Lebanon, when the image of Israel as tiny little besieged uh, David uh, 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 under attack by the fearsome Arab Goliath was turned around. You had this powerful army and this powerful air force pounding uh, the Palestinians and the Lebanese in besieged Beirut for week after week after week. It changed more during the first intifada in the late 1980s, when you had these images of children up against tanks and kids throwing stones at armed soldiers. Um, now, that doesn't mean that the, the supporters of Israel uh, lay down and, and, and took it. They, they, they retook the initiative after each of these instances. But over time, I think things have changed. I think uh, that especially with younger consumers of the media and with the rise of social media, uh, the ability of Israel to dominate the narrative in the way it did for many decades has certainly diminished. It's still there to some extent, but it's certainly diminished. True. I mean, I agree with on that aspect because um, when it comes to the social media aspect of it, because the more participative we become, the more perspectives are generated. And then, of course, there right. are chances. There are chances, of course, that certain um the core of the perspective might get diminished but at the other end i mean there's a risk that prop, there's a possibility that it might get diminished it might it might just not right. but again of course it's because it's a participative aspect of it which uh, really matters which i would anyway highlight and also because you mentioned how uh, the representation of conflict in media has stained when it comes to the contemporary aspect of it because I realized while I was watching the you know media coverage in here in Indian media of let's say the Russia Ukraine uh, conflict which is happening at present, I realized that again it's as you mentioned it is not just like again it's just not as black and white as they would present it to be to the layman audience. Again, it's shades of gray. There are different sort of mixes put into it and how they present it to us. In, even, for example... Especially like, recently. Yeah, especially recently, of course, yes. Okay. Um, you frozen. I don't, sorry, am I audible now? You are breaking up. Now you're audible, yes. Yeah, right. <clears throat> uh, I was saying that, um, and also uh, when it comes to the coverage of Middle East, because I mostly hear, let's say, although I consume, I'm very conscious of what I consume in terms of media or news outlets as such. Mm -hmm. 
um but again when it comes to the coverage of middle east as well and how mm-hmm. let's say the uh, the conflict in lebanon and the conflict let's say in um, palestine and israel in may of 2021 etc let's say the afghanistan conflict as such the way it was covered and especially when i so for example uh, especially when i talk about the middle east aspect of it this is as an observer as a consumer with a reflective lens in front of what i watch and what i don't this is what i've realized that the entire middle east is mostly shown with the victim quote and quote shade of it especially here i mean i'm not sure of how it is done in other parts of the media because of course it's not a major consumer there but yeah i mean this is this is one thing that i i mean agree upon when you say that it's a different there are different aspects to it and of course things have changed but you cannot really sort of decipher as to what why when how it is the things get more clear uh, as such and also because you um mentioned oh, in the beginning of your answer as well you mentioned about the zionist movement and also the settler colonialism aspect of it which i really wanted to talk about here as well um so dr kravi can you opine a little bit on the aspect of zionist movement which as i would also want to agree is a settler colonial movement so how do you see that it is different from um, other such movements let's say in south africa let's say in right. algeria let's say in canada good question because when we read about it for example when we read about it as a concept settler colonialism in books it is the stances are way too homogenized because for example if i have been mm. the reader of it if i have if i have been the consumer of those books it is way too homogenized and since you have been the central observer or let's say the immediate part of this entire picture of conflict what are you, right. your views on it uh, a, a, an excellent question because i think that um it's very easy to over, oversimplify it's very easy as you as you as you very acutely point out to homogenize Uh, there are many differences between settler colonial projects uh, each of them is quite different from one another one em- enormously important difference is that zionism starts in the late 19th and the 20th centuries uh, as a political project and as a settler colonial project every one of the others goes back at least half a century and many of the many centuries i mean ireland england started to settle with english and welsh and scotch protestants in 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 the 16th century or in the 17th century uh south africa is the same uh north america and australasia the same 17th to 18th century projects zionism is a modern project by comparison the second difference is that most settler colonial projects were extensions of the mother country so dutch settlers went from holland to south africa french settlers were settled in algeria british subjects were settled and so on and so forth in the british many british settler colonies uh, zionism was an independent autonomous national project which allied itself with an imperial power which could not have done what it did without the support of the british but which was independent it had its own finances it had its own leadership they were not british subjects uh, at the outset they were people from all over the world uh, 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 in, in, from the jewish diaspora all over the world so there are fundamental respects in which this is quite different and i would argue in which each settler colonial project is different from each other on the other hand you have some some enormously similar uh, uh phenomena uh, if you read about how the english treated the irish uh whether under cromwell or whether under queen elizabeth they were pushing the people off the land in much the same way they treated them as if they were inferior in much the same way what could go on go on and on and on about how a pro- process of usurpation and dispossession and population replacement uh more in some respects similar i mean that's what settler colonialism is about and so i would say the model is not terribly capacious and is not terribly sophisticated um and and doesn't make enough allowance for all of the enormous differences but there are certain aspects which clearly are similar as between a palestine and and various other cases of settler colonialism right um that totally makes sense um i assume that these are wonderful be... questions these are really <laughs> excellent questions thank you so much um i re- although i was a little skeptical because i thought um my perspectives to these questions what if they were a little limited because of course i'm just starting to work on the research aspect of things but yeah thank you so much it's it i'm glad that it comes from you 
um also moving uh, le- um, we should i guess move towards the concluding questions of course um since you since the time you wrote this book are there any um aspects or let's say uh, uh, aspects as such that you have discovered since the book came out and for example as readers as young readers how would you want to portray your book as as in when i say this what i mean is would you consider it as a basic foundation when it comes to reading about the israel palestinian conflict okay that's two good questions there the second one i'll answer first yes i still think that this is a book that anyone who wants to understand this issue would benefit from reading uh, especially people who either don't know a great deal about it or are particularly ignorant of the Palestinian perspective. Uh, many people know or think they know a great deal about the topic, but they mainly have it from one side, if they have any knowledge of it at all. And so I think this book would be extremely beneficial to the people who, and I've gotten literally scores of emails and, and, and letters and so forth from people who've said that to me. All I knew about this came from the Israeli side, You know, I may still have my views I had, but I've learned so much and it's changed some, some of what I understand. So I think that the book helps to do that. And it's intended to, 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 to speak to the general reader and to people who are not terribly knowledgeable. Um, so yes, I still think it, it, I hope, I think and hope that it still serves that purpose. There is inter- incidentally an Indian edition coming out. Uh, I think Hachette India is publishing it. Uh, I'm not quite sure when, soon. I believe it's available, the English, the UK edition, which is this edition, I believe is available in India, but there will be an Indian edition. I have the Indian one. pricing. Oh, you have it? Yeah, I do uh, have it. You have the, you, you probably have the UK edition. UK version, yes, exactly. Yeah, that's the UK edition. There's a different cover for the US edition. In any case, um, as far as the first question, which is what have I learned or what, what might have changed in my view since I, I wrote the book? Uh, I finished writing the book uh, more than two and a half years ago, um, close to three years ago, actually. Uh, and it was published at the very beginning of 2020, just at the outset of the pandemic, actually. Um, and so over two years have passed since I finished writing. Um, I, I think I've learned a great deal uh, in different respects um, in the intro. Um, I think that events in Palestine, especially what happened starting in May, of 2021 uh, around Jerusalem and then conflict involving Gaza and then the thing spreading into Israel, the Palestinian communities inside Israel uh, and the conflict spreading inside the cities like Lid and, and Haifa and Jaffa. Um, and uh, 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 things that followed on that, I think have somewhat modified some of my views uh, as far as um, Uh, internal Palestinian cohesion is concerned, as far as Palestinian identity is concerned. Uh, and I think that there have been further transformations in a direction which I indicated in the last chapter of the book in American opinion. I think that uh, young people in the United States, uh, m- members of American minorities, younger members of the American Jewish community, Many people within the Democratic Party have seen their views evolve considerably over the last two or three years to an extent that I don't think I anticipated in the book. Uh, I, I mention it. I mean, I touch on it briefly at the very end of the book. But I, I think that I would give more weight to that. Now, whether that will change in the future, I don't know. There have been shifts back and forth, obviously, in opinion and in politics on this uh, in the United States and elsewhere. Um, and there's a ferocious uh, effort to turn back these changes made by proponents of Israel, obviously. Uh, legal efforts, uh, uh, spurious charges of anti-Semitism, uh, uh, attempts to outlaw the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, and so on. Um, firing people in universities all over Europe, uh, in England, in Germany, uh, journalists uh, who, who say certain things are just fired. Um, so it's not like events are going in one direction. There, there, there's a back and a forth. Uh, there's a back and forth uh, to it. But I think I would give more attention to that because I think understanding how this issue may evolve will very much depend on things uh, like that. Um, 
And I think that the global situation, I mean, I, 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 I stress heavily the impact of the global situation on Palestine throughout the book. And obviously one cannot predict the future, but I don't think anybody would have predicted the developments in great power relations and in European events and or European events, such as we've seen over the Ukraine um, three years ago. I don't think anybody would have predicted. There were a few people who warned against it, a few realists, people like John Mearsheimer, uh, Kissinger, uh, much, much earlier, uh, uh, Kennan, uh, the, the, the architect of the policy of containment of the Soviet Union, George Kennan. All of these people warned uh, that there would be a conflict with Russia uh, over NATO expansion. Um, but I don't think, I don't, I, and so what I'm trying to say is, now I don't want to say anything about the Ukraine because it's an evolving situation precisely. Um, but even as a historian, I think we have a responsibility to, to understand how the past affects the present. And the past has changed. I mean, what's now passed in the last three years um, is very different to the way things looked in 2019 when I was right, when I finished writing this book. So I would, I think I would modify a lot of that. Um, and I think that there are various, um, maybe important modifications I would give to some of the views I express in the book, but those are less important, I think. Right, that makes total sense. And also um, when you said that past affects the present, this is something um, I as a journalism student, although there are very um, a lot of ethical dilemmas at present, especially with regards to Indian media, but this is something uh, what we in our classes as well are taught that when it comes to, let's say, covering any story as such, or even while you are at the research stage of anything at all, it is required that you are not looking at a event as such or a theme as such in isolation because it is connected. It is interdisciplinary. It might also be multidisciplinary in various aspects, as you just mentioned. So yes, I mean, I do agree with that. And um, sadly, we have reached the end of this interview. I have one last question for you. That um, what are the other projects that you are currently working upon, if you are? And can you probably tell us a little bit about them so that we can keep an eye on them if in case they're coming in the near future? Well, I, I'm, I'm actually currently in Ireland uh, working on a project that relates to an answer I gave you earlier, which is to try and introduce some sophistication into this concept of settler colonialism as an undifferentiated homogenous, the word you used was homogenous, and that's a good, good word, or undifferentiated uh, 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 phenomenon. I don't think it is. I, I think one can learn a great deal from deep study of another, another settler colonial project, which is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to learn more about Irish history in Ireland. And uh, I think that it's very clear that Ireland was the template for so much of what the English and later the British did in their empire in terms of colonialism generally, whether in India or Iraq or Egypt or Nigeria, but in terms especially of settler colonialism, where they settled the European population in a native land. And I think that, uh, 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 I hope that some kind of study of, of Ireland will help me uh, to introduce more sophistication uh, into this settler colonial model, model generally and into an understanding of the specifics of Palestinian history. So it's, I'm at the very beginning of, of working on this. I have no idea how it will go. I have no sense of what the product will be, whether there'll be an article or a book or a, some lectures, I don't know. Um, but I hope, that, I hope that I will be able to benefit um, from my immersion in Irish history to come to a better understanding. It's exactly of what you, you, you correctly described as this over homogenous sense of settler colonialism. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for, uh, um, and also I would like to mention that you are one of the first uh, interviewers here with Unstand because Unstand is something we just recently started. We were although working on different range of podcasts, but Unstand, you're the first. Uh, you are yours will be the first episode that will go out, and I'm really glad that you joined us here. And I do Thank have, you. and I do have a couple of um, things that I might just go back and think upon and ponder upon certain statements that I was just taking a note of while you were speaking. And yeah, and I think this is going to be an amazing episode when, is, when it goes out, especially, so. for, when it goes, especially for the students um, like me and others who are in the same field or the, uh, you know, students who are in the field of history. 
yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for coming in. We are happy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for tuning into this conversation. We really hope you enjoyed this, and if you did, please consider subscribing to our channel and podcast for more such amazing content. We have a series of amazingly curated interactions with authors and scholars on the issues of contemporary relevance. Do check out our website www.ergostudios.com for more blogs and podcasts exploring the tales of contemporary relevance. Do follow us on our social media sites for more exciting updates. Until next time, stay safe and stay curious.